Hi guys, today I'd like to give you some sort of, you know, theoretical talk about modeling kernels in general and the position of Open Cascade on this market. Because as you might guess, Open Cascade is not the only solution to geometric modeling, and if you list all other CAT kernels, you will see we will have just a handful of libraries. And perhaps the most well proven, the most commercially successful libraries are ACES and Parasolid, because there is a bunch of CAD modeling packages which completely rely on them. For example, SolidWorks is based on Parasolid, while SpaceClaim is featured by ACES. Then there is Cartier geometric modeler or Convergence geometric modeler, like they call it, and it's a groundwork, it's a backbone of Cartier. Then there is a couple of newcomer libraries, and one of them is C3D, which is a, a groundwork, which is a basis of a locally popular Russian CAD package named Compass. And the developers of C3D, they publish their documentation on the internet, so you can check what this kernel can do uh, without any registration. Then I also wanted to have here this RGK thingy, which is, you know, a sort of phantom geometric modeling kernel, which has never been released, actually, and you cannot go and license this kernel. But still, it's a pretty interesting project, because RGK stimulated research in our CAD domain. It allowed us to sort of refresh on the foundations of geometric modeling field and computer-aided design, and some interesting papers were published. We cannot say right now that this RGK was a completely like a failed attempt to create a new commercial or non-commercial kernel, because we do not even know the licensing terms about this. And the same way we cannot say that it's a failed attempt, because new people have been involved and our field has got kind of a new breath. Then there is SMLib, and although it's not that popular as, for example, ACES, Parasolid or OpenCascade, I really wanted this library to be listed here as well. Because SMLib is remarkable, at least in two aspects. And the first aspect about SMLib is that it's truly scientific. It's based on the NURBS book, which is a sort of a Bible book for people who develop NURBS kernels, NURBS computations from scratch. Another remarkable thing about SMLIP is the way you license it. For other commercial libraries, you normally get only the binaries for one or another platform. While with SMLIP, at least uh, when I came across this library for the first time, it was also possible to get access to sources. And this means that if the vendor company, the company uh, developing SMLIP somehow goes out of business, you are kind of secured. But that's not only about legal issues, you know, because it's just pretty handy to be able to dig into the sources of the library and to see how one or another function works and how to pass your arguments to uh, these modeling functions exposed by a library. And I also think that this business model where you deliver not only the binaries but also the sources, even if you keep your intellectual properties and all the copyrights with some restriction, is the way better business model when just delivering some binaries. Because imagine what you want to introduce some minor modifications to be able like to compile your library on a on a different Linux distributive, for example. What you will do? Will you have to ask for support and pay big money to your vendor company, or could you just recompile it, uh, recompile the whole thing by yourself and uh, introduce the changes you want? Because why not, after all? You pay the money. And this discussion about availability of sources brings us naturally to OpenCascade, because OpenCascade is the only open source kernel among the listed ones. And that's why we love it. Although you might argue that OpenCasky doesn't stand out in terms of features, because in terms of features, indeed, it doesn't contain any breakthrough functionality, still it simply works. And it allows us to design products in 3D for different engineering and not only engineering uses. So let's go on to see what we can do with OpenCascade. But before we dive deeper into OpenCascade itself, let's devote a couple of minutes and actually the rest of this lesson to the underlying technology. How would we model, how would we represent our shapes in a computer memory? And the main question for us is, uh, 
Software developers is how to build up a geometric modeling system which could answer different geometric questions we are going to ask like what is the surface area, what is the volume of our object, what are the hidden lines and all these things. So basically the main question which our system should be able to answer is whether or not a single point from an ambient space belongs to object we are going to represent. And this is what is called point membership classification question or PMC. There are many ways how to answer that question and uh, let's start from constructive solid geometry or CSG. In CSG what you have is a list of primitives all defined analytically. For example, you have a sphere described by its center and radius and you have a box uh, described by its uh, corner position and, and its dimensions. And you end up with having your final shape by putting all these primitives in a tree, which is a sort of a program, it's sort of specification how to combine, or subtract and uh, intersect those primitives to produce the final result. CSG is pretty convenient in a sense that you will never end up with some broken geometry. And in the worst case you will have just an empty result. But if you put your arguments in some meaningful way, then you are sure that you will have just solid and perfect object out of your CSG program. And the problem with CSG is that it's sort of limited because you do not have any explicit representation for your boundaries and you have to evaluate them. And also the representational power of CSG is limited because you only ground your modeling on a set of predefined primitives. And very likely you do not have just an infinite set of primitives, you have just a, like a collection of them. Quite often CSG is considered as an old and legacy and even dead technology, but that's not necessarily true. Because CSG has got another incarnation, so to speak, in the classical feature-based modeling applications, like in SOLIDWORKS, for example. There it finds its niche, because what is a feature? A volumetric feature is basically a result of a Boolean operation between a stock volume or a previous feature and some feature descriptor. So imagine like you have a stock volume, which is a piece of a raw material, and when you want to drill a hole out of it, so you take a cylindrical tool and you run Boolean subtraction between these two operands. And then you store the sequence of operations somewhere in your application and you end up finally with a sort of, you know, sort of something which looks a little bit like a CSG tree. But okay, finally CSG is not the best technology out there and there are just better technologies like boundary representation. And boundary representation is simply more computationally convenient and more general because it allows you to represent a larger variety of shapes. The very idea of boundary representation is to give exact mathematical equations to the curves and surfaces which compose the exterior of your model in 3D. We can actually speak a lot about the underlying data structure behind BREP and all this, you know, separation onto topology and geometry, which is sort of well-turned idea. But all these things, you know, they are just implementation details. And what is important, what is really important is the very idea to describe a shape as a set of its boundaries. And here we have to employ, in order to be precise, we have to employ the whole apparatus of computational geometry. And this is where this modeling stuff starts to be really scientific and interesting. Then there is another modeling technique which can be seen actually as a special case for boundary representation. It's a facet or mesh modeling. Here you still have the explicit representation of your boundary, but instead of using curved and parametric surfaces, you are using something more simple like triangles or quadrangles. And like this you can simplify the underlying data structures quite a bit. Because you do not need to have any parametric equations and all you need is some sort of unstructured grid, like a list of primitives all composed of nodes coming in some predefined order. And this is a very popular approach to modeling, especially in computer graphics domain, including gaming or sculpturing, because here you can build up very efficient and robust modeling algorithms. The drawback of this modeling approach is pretty obvious at the same time. You model for shape and you do not model for accuracy. 
and the accuracy is sacrificed for better efficiency, robustness and simplicity of this whole thing. And the major drawback of this faceted representation for traditional CAD applications such as CNC machining for example is unavailability of features. Because if you want to manufacture something, if you want to produce a million path for your product, you need to know the exact surface types. Or if you want, for example, to run any sort of numerical simulation, you might want to generate a finite element model out of your master shape. And with faceted representation, you simply do not have this master shape. You simply do not have this ideal state of geometry, which can be used as a primary representation to derive all the secondary representations. Then there is another way of modeling, which is voxelization. It's a sort of decomposition scheme, where you strive to describe your shape not as an object itself, but as a piece of volume in the ambient space where your object is embedded to. Here you can use different approaches for decomposition, starting from plain and simple uniform decomposition, where you have like a 3D raster image, and ending up with some more advanced techniques, for example, such as adaptive distance fields. Such adaptive schemes are more compressed and they allow for saving a great deal of memory and computational resources. So, how would we choose a shape representation scheme if there are so many of them? Well, fortunately, this choice was largely made for us. Because there is this ISO 10303 standard that poses boundary representation to be the ultimate way of describing a digital product. So if you want to stay compliant with this widely adopted standard, which is also known as a step standard, you'd go for a BREP modeling scheme. And you know, it's not surprising to have this boundary representation as a part of ISO standard, because after all, boundary representation resembles traditional engineering drawings with all those lines and arcs and splines because in boundary representation we still have explicit graphical entities for our boundaries and we can attach different attributes such as dimensions and tolerances and even some design review notes to these graphical entities, to these boundary elements. And this is something we do not have in CSG or voxelization approaches. And also it's sort of complicated to do the same thing for faceted models because in faceted models we do not have explicit features and looking at a set of facets you never know which feature exactly is being represented by this group of facets because you will need to have some feature recognition before you can answer this question and also you will never have this infinite precision so that boundary representation is simply better. Nowadays, boundary representation is sort of dominated in technology in CAD and CAM markets. And the main reason for that is that boundary representation strikes just the right balance between computational efficiency, accuracy and clearness to a human being. Because humans have used drawings for centuries if not thousands of years and boundary representation is a natural successor to this drawing business. Alright, so boundary representation is simply good in all aspects, but that's actually too good to be true. And the problem here is that it's insanely hard to develop a robust, accurate and efficient boundary modeling kernel. It's extremely hard to build up a decent geometric modeling system. So what we are going to do in the upcoming lessons is we are going to get started with Open Cascade kernel. That comes up with all necessary features right out of the box. And in the next lesson we will speak about Open Cascade in a bit more detail, so stay tuned and thank you for watching.